It's a great pleasure to be speaking to you all today. And uh, um, yeah, indeed, I'm an artist based here in, in uh, Brussels, uh, originally from the US. And uh, I'd like to speak to you today from that uh, perspective, from that vantage point uh, as an artist um, dealing with the topic, which is um, has deep uh, historical and political implications. But um, I'd also like to talk about it uh, in the way that it's figured in my own personal experience. Um, yeah, growing up as a Pakistani American in the, in the US. Um, and in some ways, I'd also like to, uh, this is indeed my work has dealt with the wind and fluid dynamics, um, this kind of intersection. Um, but for me, this is a type of return as well to talk about um, work that I'd done 10 years prior and which for me felt like kind of an unfinished uh, project. So in this, this presentation is kind of uh, mapping that trajectory as well. So um, I'd like to start, uh, you know, as, as uh, Nick mentioned, I'm also, uh, will be presenting a work at the exhibition and uh, Part of what you're seeing are some sketches uh, towards that as well, um, and, and a kind of th a thinking process. Um, so what you're seeing here is a reconstruction of a geometric pattern, which is um, originally in the, uh, which you'd normally find in the Alhambra in Spain, Granada, Spain. Um, what's interesting about it for me, as it relates to my current work, is that it's a vortical pattern, that it's kind of rotating, so each intersection can be seen as a vortice. Um, and, uh, you know, like, as we know, what's interesting about vortices is that they're constantly present all around us. We just uh, often don't pay attention to them, or in the case of the medium of the air, we don't, uh, um, we don't have the sense perception to really detect them. Uh, so one particular thing about vortices is that they're always turning in, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. So in the case of the toilet here, it's turning uh, counterclockwise, and in the case of the the spiral, the grand design spiral galaxy, which is its actual name, it's turning the other way. One thing that I'd also like to kind of present here is, um, is an another way that spirals and vortices figure um, as a movement through time, uh, but as a kind of particular way of figuring um, historical time. So, oops, yeah, so that means that um, how is uh, time being, uh, how is history being constituted by the repetition of events rather than the simple linear accumulation of the past into the present and into the future and so on, which we know as from some of the previous presentations causes a lot of um, difficulty in the way that history is constituted or selectively um, presented. So in the repetition of historical events um, and in their reoccurrence, not only uh, and in, th in that case, like thinking about what is the form of their appearance over time, it's not always the same thing which is happening over and over as it appears the same way, but uh, uh, there's a kind of non-sensual similarity to quote, uh, to use an Adorno's term, let's say. So um, this image, I think I, I return to it now because it will also present a kind of, um, uh, it also presents uh, an, a kind of analog for the way that my presentation is. <laughs> uh, probably that's because that's the way I am, in a sense. Um, you can render this pattern in two different ways. So each point can be a vortice, which is a kind of spiral, which can uh, move infinitely towards a single geometric point. Uh, you can also render it the other way, which is that uh, there's a single vortice in the center and everything is kind of moving towards it. Um, so as a kind of, uh, to make it 3D, to literalize what I just said, you know, uh, there's a kind of infinite point that this spiral is moving towards, either as a singular form or as a multiple form. And uh, I, I talk about that because um, when I present this, when I, when I deal with this topic and uh, all of the research that I've encountered in the course of this presentation, every point, uh, every node or piece of information felt that it had kind of infinite depth, as you might, uh, experience in your own work as a kind of researcher, that you can kind of uh, stumble into each instance. Um, just before I depart entirely from fluid dynamics and, and, and art, let's say, um, and into the realm of um, uh, the history of Islam and the, the context of uh, what constitutes the, the, 
the global body of believers, or what's also known as the Ummah, uh, I, I have found one other kind of intersection, which for me helps to keep me kind of sane. And it's this, uh, there's a, an uh, essay by the German Islamic art historian named Richard Ettinghausen, entitled Taming the Horror Vacui. And uh, Taming the Horror Vacui, um, it's his kind of way of explaining why the entirety of Islamic art appears the way that it does. Um, the horror vacui is borrowing from a term which originates from a kind of Aristotelian concept, um, which is that uh, this idea that nature abhors a vacuum, nature hates a vacuum, meaning that if you, for example, if you have a bucket of water and you scoop out uh, a cup of it, all of the water around it will, will rush in to fill that emptiness, to fill that void, you know? Um, and uh, that's how it is in physics. That's how uh, many people have thought about the, the reason why all of the winds of the world are moving, because they're constantly trying to fill the low pressure areas, all of the, the emptinesses, the, uh, the voids. And uh, if you kind of transcribe this to a sort of um, uh, psychological state, let's say, uh, it's often uh, thought of as the fear of empty spaces, uh, the kind of fear of emptiness. And uh, for... Uh, when it's kind of then further transcribed as a kind of psychological motivation, as an art historical impulse, it's often talked about as um, the, the impulse to fill every part of a page. Uh, so you'll see it in, for example, Christian illumination manuscripts. You'll see it also in um, what you'd call like outsider art, uh, where you have a kind of like entire uh, surface being filled. And for Ettinghausen, uh, this is the reason why Islamic uh, uh, art is characterized by immensely geometrically ornamented spaces because um, uh, the, the nomads of the Arabian Peninsula at that time, let's say in the seventh century, um, were passing vast empty tracts of the desert, um, which Maya also brought up, the, sa the sandiness of the Arabian desert, let's say. Um, so maybe she has something in common in this case with Ettinghausen. Um, but this kind of emptiness and the, f the need to feel a sense of presence, the need to feel um, presence. So that's why you would have this motivation to completely inscribe every millimeter of a space with the kind of pattern that could expand infinitely. Um, so, I mean, that also says something about a certain um, ontological worldview, a metaphysical worldview of uh, um, the need to, where is that presence kind of coming from? Uh, and that
as a testament to the greatness of the civilization which will have passed at that moment. Um, so if we look at the Hall of the Ambassadors, um, which, is, which is the throne room of the Alhambra, um, uh, I, I chose to use this older photo from 1870, um, which is one of the periods that we can track as one of where the concept of the Ummah is really like emerging in other parts of the world at this moment. Um, and it contains a, a, a heavy, heavy amount of inscriptions, uh, but the one key inscription on the throne itself says that there is no victor but God. Um, and the importance of that is that, uh, well, it's, it tries to set up a kind of hierarchical, hierarchical relationship between um, like, uh, the greatness of this uh, civilization which uh, produced something so fabulous as the Alhambra and the court and the throne room and so on, um, which is then passing its attribution to a, an even higher power, which is, which is uh, God himself. So um, in the piety, it has a, a greater, it, it kind of valorizes itself in its own piety, let's say. Now, if we jump <laughs> from 1492 to uh, 1985, the year I was born, well, when we were in school, we would say, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and he was actually sent by Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, uh, who were the conquerors of, of the Alhambra, to, you know, to the States, and all that ensued. So we have this kind of 500-year period in the middle. Um, and uh, I grew up here. Uh, which is the Islamic Center of Greater Toledo. Um, it's built in the cornfields of Northwest Ohio, which used to be the Great Black Swamp, and um, was uh, drained, and uh, now is like a, a kind of a, yeah, very uh, absolutely flat land, let's say. Um, I use this image here because uh, in 2013, I actually published um, a, a paper in a Russian, uh, a publication called The New Literary Observer on the relationship of form identity, form and identity in Midwestern Islamic architecture. And yeah, it's a bit novel for me that it appears in, in, in Russian in this case. Um, so um, when, we're, when we're in the mosque, let's say, like what, our, what Muslims are doing um, in, this, in this case is like um, you start the, oops. Uh, in the prayer in the prayer hall, uh, you're supposed to pray five times a day, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, technically. And the the starting words of the Quran are alif lam mim. So these are letters that nobody quite knows what they mean. They're kind of like a lot of speculation, mystical kind of speculation on what that actually means. But then the next surah, uh, the, the the prayer, the first prayer of in in the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha, which goes something like this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ayyaka na'abadu wa ayyaka nasta'in, ahdina sirat al-mustakim wa sirat al-ladina, anamta alayhim, khair al-makdubi alayhim, wa lad-da'aleen, ameen, sadaqallahu al-adim. So, that's the Surah al-Fatiha. All Muslims will know very familiarly. Does anybody know what that means? Does anybody know what I just said? Okay, yeah, because I also don't know what I said, in fact. <laughs> I, have no, I have no idea, in fact. Um, I, was, uh, I was taught how to read the Quran by, um, I was taught how to read the Quran by my mother and then also Sunday school's teachers at that mosque and uh, by my, especially by my mom who um, would sit down with us like three, four times a week and drill into us all of the phonetic pronunciation of classical Arabic. And, uh, but she herself also didn't understand Arabic, and she had been taught as well from her parents, her mother, and special teachers that were coming in Pakistan to, to uh, deliver tutoring and Quranic recitation, who also didn't understand Arabic. Um, but the, the unique thing about the Quran is that it is the direct word of, uh, of God in Arabic. So this is the, that's one of the... Uh, claims of moral superiority that Islam can claim over the other monotheistic religions, which it sees itself as the, the last of, so Christian, uh, Judaism, Christianity, then Islam, is that it's never changed, uh, supposedly. So even there's value in the recitation of the word itself, you know, uh, of, of the, uh, 
there's value in because that is the word of God, and that's the that's the reason why it's okay for generations of people, millions and millions of people, who can read and uh, read Arabic but just don't know what they're saying. Um, so what, for me, a, qu a question as I start to embark on this project for um, the the exhibition and producing a new work for it is, um, what do I do with this skill set that I have and that m many many people have? Um, uh, and it actually is a way of constituting a particular community. And in my mind, this is a, a key feature of the contemporary um, Islamic global Muslim community in a way, but it's just an unexpected one. So I'm playing with the kind of transliteration. Uh, so this is like, yeah, Arabic, hello world, which in coding is the first thing that you would always write when you want the, you know, to see if your code works. And then I just wrote, where am I? Just, yeah, it came out of the top of my head. So I can write Arabic, I can read it, but I just never know. So in this case, I'm trying to turn it into um, English and, uh, hof and possibly Dutch at, at the, at the MUCA. So the second proposition, I mean, I'd like to make is like, who would like to... Um, who would like to become a Muslim today? <laughs> All you have to do is say, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah illa la Muhammad Rasulullah, three times. So if you want, we can do it three times. I'll do it three times. You can recite after me if you want, or you can do it in your heart. It's, a, you know, it's just a, a possibility. And you can decide if that's even meaningful to you or it isn't. So, Ashhadu la ilaha illa la Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu la ilaha illa la Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu la ilaha illa la Muhammad Rasulullah. And for me, I never actually had the re or the moment to say it because it was whispered into my ear by my uncle the uh, the first day I was born. So <laughs> that's how I became uh, a Muslim. In fact, um, yeah. Uh, and what it means is that there is no God. There is only one God, and Muhammad is his last messenger. So what's interesting about this is like why maybe you guys feel uncomfortable about. Uh, now reciting the creed of Islam and becoming technically a Muslim, but why do you respect that barrier? Why, do you, why is that important when we talk about the flexibility and the malleability of language and the arts, um, and we're constantly inventing language all of the time, why do we suddenly respect the borders of, of, uh, this, uh, of this decree, you know? Because um, certainly I feel like there is an edge, and that's, that's interesting to me. So um, another key feature of Islam is that it is the last religion, or, uh, it's very clever in this other way too, is that Muhammad is the last messenger of Islam, of, of not Islam, but the last messenger of God, and of the monotheistic God, of the uh, Abrahamic faiths God. So that means that humanity is essentially adrift. There's no more messages coming after 700 AD. We're sort of just completely on our own, and we have to kind of deal with all of our contemporary situations, uh, with a kind of moral guidance of examples that had happened 700 years, or now 1,000 years prior, let's say 1,300 years prior. The closest thing I can relate to that is like, what the image that comes to my mind is in science fiction. Um, you have uh, oftentimes this kind of tropes of uh, just people floating in space <laughs> in, in one direction uh, kind of uh, unendingly. So this is essentially the, the, the sense of humanity's yeah, a kind of adrift. This is the kind of Islamic worldview if you, I mean, I don't say it's a worldview of Muslims. I can say it's, a, let's say, a, an Islamic worldview. So in any case, um, I'd like to uh, break it down a little bit further because for me, like, um, the question is like, how do we how do we deal with these sort of overall claims and not uh, and not allow ourselves to become um, functionaries of them, but really like to to kind of uh, throw them into relief and and take out the tangibility of them. For me, one uh, way that I did it was that um, I, in dealing with the concept of the ummah, like in this mosque on the left side, you see a model of the mosque which we always were presented with. The model, the building is huge. It was actually the largest mosque in North America. Through, the, through 1996, and if you see on this model, all of the buildings that are proposed surrounding it are much larger than even that building, and they're like a old folks' home, a school, and so on, but none of those things are actually built. It's just the idea of projecting into a future, like projecting the community's existence into a future. And what's also curious to me is it's also projecting into the past, uh, because the Ummah is something which supposedly had existed as a, as a global 
Islamic uh, civilization, um, which was uh, kind of a singular whole, and then had been lost and needed to be reconstituted. But what's interesting for me is that if you look at the architecture, it's based off of an octagonal plan with a dome, and that's actually derived um, from the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Maybe you guys know this building. And what's really interesting about the Dome of the Rock is like it points towards actually the first moments of strife. It's, it's actually a dome around a rock, which this idea where uh, Muhammad um, ascended to the heavens on the back of uh, Al-Baraka, which is a, a winged beast, let's say. And, um, but in fact, uh, this was uh, a building that was created by the second Umayyad Caliph in 692 AD um, as an attempt to create another uh, site of equal spiritual importance to Mecca, which is where the seat of power of the Abbasids was. And uh, as you might know, all Muslims still pray towards Mecca these days. So what, there's already, after 100 years, 100 years after the death of the Prophet, there was already a split in the dynasties. There was already, um, he had four companions who kind of took on the caliphs, let's say. Um, uh, they were chosen from among his companions and they were all assassinated. And then there was a major split into a dynastic um, yeah, uh, regimes that kind of occurred. So, in fact, this points towards the, that there was never a, a, single, a singular Islamic uh, community. It never existed. Um, and this could also be just any rock. It might not be the rock that Muhammad the sent it to the, to the um, heavens on. Um, bless his soul. Uh, this, is the, um, this is the current biggest mosque in U.S., which is not far from the Islamic Center of Greater Toledo, where I grew up, it's about a 45-minute drive in Dearborn, Michigan, which has the largest community of Lebanese and Syrians outside of Syria, who have been a community that's been in the region for over 150 years, working in automotive plants and so on. And it has the same exact plan as the one, uh, as the Islamic Center of Greater Toledo, which is the octagonal plan. So this is to show, indeed, that um, there's a prevalence of this. So. Uh, I'd like to change registers again. Like, uh, okay, we can explain indeed like that this community never existed. Uh, I, can, I can prove it historically, let's say, but uh, there is still something before, uh, there is still something that might exist on an emotive level, which is, which is very peculiar. And, and I experienced this the first time when I was young. I was six years old when the first Gulf War happened. And uh, we were looking at images on CNN broadcast live of, um, uh, of smart bombs and missiles attacking uh, Iraqi uh, installations, and indeed, in this, we were, you could see people actually being killed uh, directly on screen. You know, um, as you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner. And my parents were deeply upset and saddened by this. One is probably because it's like this uh, extreme amount of asymmetrical warfare. Um, but uh, it had this, uh, which, which itself is a kind of atrocity uh, that we've just learned to live with. Uh, asymmetrical warfare, I mean, classical notions of uh, warfare was that the soldier was equally ready to die as he was to kill. Um, and uh, Gregory Camus' book, Drone Warfare, uh, Drone Theory, sorry, really elaborates on this, like, qualities of asymmetry. Um, but there was, there was an emotional, um, sadness within the community and also in my parents when we, see, when we saw images like this, you know? And if you see here, this is like since 2012, it's a bit outdated, you know? Um, but this is uh, all of the regions of conflict where contemporary wars have happened, you know, from 2000 to 2012. Um, this is another map which is generated by the um, by the organization of Islamic cooperation, which is another formulation of this idea that there is a global uh, sense of Muslims, let's say, and that they're all nation states, but maybe all of these nation states are part of a singular country, let's say. This is what they tried to propose. I mean, and it's probably the equivalent as much as the UN is really representing a world government, let's say. But we can see a, already a kind of like overlay between the areas of conflict and the Muslim world as, as is represented by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. And this is Mecca here in their emblem with the star and crescent. Yeah, five minutes, okay. And you see that Syria has been excluded. 
This is a, a survey here uh, that's of Muslims um, in different countries, Kuwait, Egypt, Palestine, conducted by Carnegie Mellon and Maryland uh, State University about you know, asking questions like, um, do you personally, f uh, do you support the establishment of Islamic Caliph State, you know? And if you look at countries like Pakistan, like it's 85% in 2007, but these are also countries that have deep political instability. And uh, what I want to go towards is, um, where does this concept of the Muslim world really come from? You know, and uh, I might go a little bit over time to confess, but uh, where does it come from? It, it comes like it was originally published uh, in 1914 in the Muslim World volume um, by a, a missionary named Samuel Zwemer, uh, who is, grew up in Vriesland, Michigan. Vriesland, yeah, Michigan, not far from where I grew up, and Vriesland, not far from where we are now, which I find funny. But um, he, he, was trying to cons he was trying to deal with his missionary work, which, it which superseded ethnic bounds, and trying to address it as a commonality. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a map that he produced in 1914. This is the map that I was presented with at the mosque, which was hanging in the halls of the mosque as something that we just accepted as a kind of commonality. But this is, the problem with this is that we never really question what is constituting, um, where do these things sort of come from in a way? It seems happy and pleasant, beautiful architecture and so on. But um, what are the political undertones? And that's what I'd like to elaborate really quickly here. So another form, we have the Organization of Islamic Countries. Another form that we have here is like, this is the Islamic State who tries to capitalize on this notion of the Ummah, which had preceded them, and they just kind of came up and really like opportunistically tried to mobilize the sentiments that people sort of feel, um, uh, in a way. And uh, they say, we don't believe in the Sykes-Picot Agreement, so, which is the agreement between French and the, and the British after World War I to separate um, all of the countries. You know? So as, a, as an act, they bulldozed the barrier between the two countries. Um, but what's, uh, what's interesting for me is like, um, like the, the automatically you would expect for the Muslim country, community, let's say, to, to uh, make a response to the Islamic State and say like, ah, but we're not them, you know? But I think this is actually falling deeper into the trap uh, of the Islamic State in a sense because there is no real, um, there is no political body which can act on behalf and formulate a position uh, uh, saying that oh, we don't agree with the Islamic State and to, uh, to utter uh, that and to constitute it would be, the, would be the actual mistake in a sense. So to go a little bit deeper into the origin now, um, these, are, these, are the three em these are three emperors of the gunpowder dynasties in the 1700s and uh, this is Suleiman the Magnificent, the Emperor Akbar of the, of the Mughal period, who's riding this elephant, you know, like producing one of his great feats to, to tame this wild, the other wild elephant um, named Wind, actually. And then we have Napoleon uh, at the moment of his conquest of, of Cairo and Egypt. And Napoleon actually converted to Islam because he found it to be, um, you know, advantageous at that time. Akbar invented his own religion that synthesized all of the religions of the South, of South Asia. Suleiman the Magnificent did quite a similar thing because these were emperors in a, in a moment of empire, which was trying to integrate many different kind of polities and ethnicities into one, into one, um, uh, into one political body. So. Uh, they were actually more flexible-minded than, than we are now, I, I would say, in a sense, because they managed to move beyond the, um, the, the paradigms of that. Um, because what you see that and what follows them immediately afterwards, which is like the fate of the gunpowder dynasties, like in 1914, these are three different images, three different places where the, the concept of the Ummah is really being like propelled. This is the first instance where it's really uh, taking on what we now know it to be, which is like a kind of sense of identity based off of a nation state, let's say. Um, where we have the Ottomans, you know, on the verge of collapse, uh, trying to rally uh, around a, a religious cause. We have, this is a st film still from Lawrence of Arabia, but you know, um, He's, he's trying to um, somehow unify the Arabs in their war against uh, uh, the British Arabs uh, in the, during World War I uh, against uh, the Germans. And then we have the Germans in Afghanistan who are also trying to uh, popularize the concept of Ummah um, 
you know, uh, to fight against the British in Afghanistan. So this is like sort of where it comes from, and this is this imperial notion, and I think that's why it's important to read Lenin, you know, and imperial, imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, in a sense, to really look into that. Um, just to point at a second reoccurrence, in 2006, there was a second Gulf War in Iraq, and I abandoned my, my um, crusade to, not my crusade, <laughs> I, abandoned my, I abandoned my effort to find a stu student organization called the Muslim Students Association, which is a, glo uh, a nationwide uh, student organization to fund platypus. And platypus here is at the protest of the anti-war protests here holding a sign that says, humanity's interest lies in the Marxist clarification of the concept of freedom, which for me was like uh, fantastically, um, fantastically liberating at the moment and still is uh, as a way to look at how history is really playing itself out. I just want to very, very quickly um, point towards this question of like art. You know, like we'll see things like Jamil Price for contemporary Islamic art still. So these, this concept of the Islamic world perpetuates and continues today. Um, the, the historian Chaim, Chamil Aden says that's because the politics post-World War II didn't deal with, um, only focus on ethnicity as a form of discrimination. But it's still a question, why does it persist? You know, and it's probably because it has to do with these wars and so on. But you know, this would never, you never see the Jamil Price for contemporary Christian art or Jewish art, you know? And oftentimes it's actually like a revitalization of, um, revitalization of craft traditions. The last thing I want to say, very last thing, sorry, uh, about, uh, about, about the, what, what would be an Islamic art, right? And uh, the way that it's talked about now, when it's not, when it's, uh, the way that it's talked about now by the most contemporary scholarship is like particularly within this paradigm to create a hierarchy between the seen and the unseen, the seen and the unseen world, which is like, you know, it, it's most easy to get down with the kind of Sufi notion of Islam in which there is the, the ghaib and the al ghaib, the, the visible and the invisible, um, and, the, and this kind of mysticism that occurs. But, you know, like this is a long quotation, let's say, but it's really, um, pointing towards this problematic uh, in which um, if you have a mystical worldview, the only image I can really create in my mind of it, similar to the sci-fi one, is this is sort of like vampirism, where everything that exists in our material reality is constantly being kind of obfuscated upwards to prove a sort of divine order. And we, we don't really address or touch upon the, the actual material content and the subtleties that are in there. Um, especially when we're talking about matters of religion and faith, uh, which, which, are deeply, which are actually political issues, not really anything more than that. And um, yeah, so I think I will, f I'm gonna flip, flash through these real fast and then you can just, I won't say anything, and then you can ask me about them. <laughs> this is top copy scrolls, one of the only drawings, examples of craftsmen, let's say. Uh, existing. Timur, tomb of Zimurat Khatun. Yeah, so I think I'll just leave it on this on this side here. Yeah. <laughs>